Welcome to the Undefined Podcast. I'm Jared Palmer. And I'm Ken Wheeler. And today we have a super duper special guest, the inventor of CSS, Adam Wathen. How's it going, Adam? <laughs> Great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. So this episode, even though it's been a little delayed, uh, is sponsored by Prisma, uh, which is a next generation database toolkit for an ORM for Node.js and TypeScript that makes working with databases easy. We'll talk about that later in the show, but without further ado, what up, Adam? Not much, you know, just been waiting for this podcast to start for a while here. You know? I know, right? It's kind of embarrassing that we had this whole like... A little bit of a shit show. A little bit of a shit show. It, um, and it's it's just, you know, is I what it is. I'm going to go buy some Zoom shares right now. Like that's what Seriously, like this, like... <laughs> I will say this. The restream thing was working for a while. Yeah. Like it was, it was great until it wasn't. Video. It is what it is. Yeah. It is uh, what it is. One day so, we'll we'll figure out how to record video in a web browser, but actually today isn't that day. Yeah. Today is not that day. It's so true, but in the meantime, Adam, why don't we rewind a bit and so just to summarize, uh we talked a little bit about um like what Tailwind is, but why don't we start again and sort of sure. stay for the rest of the rest of the Yeah, team. yeah. Yeah. So tell us. Tailwind is a, we call it a utility first CSS framework, which is our sort of catchy tagline that we uh, came up with. And um, general idea is that instead of like a bunch of classes like button or form input or, you know, what a card or whatever other sort of stuff you'd see with a bunch of other frameworks, we just give you like really, really low level primitives like flex and BG black and font bold and text Excel and stuff like that. And um, the idea is you just kind of use that stuff to design directly in your markup without ever really reaching for CSS files at all. And uh, it looks like a terrible idea from the outside. And, but most people I find when they actually give it five minutes and play with it, start to question how they ever could have like worked in the more traditional way um in the past at all because it's like such a nightmare in comparison especially when it comes to like the biggest thing is you, you're not wasting time naming classes all day which is what you're normally doing in css you're making a div and you're thinking okay i gotta style this so to style it i need to decide how i'm gonna target it which means i need to give it some sort of identifier which now means every single element in your whole file needs some sort of fancy name and uh yeah, that is super paralyzing. And I don't think people even realize like how much that's slowing them down until you actually stop doing it. It's funny when it clicks, you're like, oh, wait, this fucks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, and, and it takes like, I, I'd say it takes like a day or two. But once you like yeah. get it, um, I, I what I think is probably the most powerful part about it is that, like, you say what you will about responsive design, but just doing responsive CSS by not writing CSS is so liberating. Yeah. Like the small tweaks part of it is just so powerful. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can do anything responsibly too, right? It's it's super inspired by like how the bootstrap grid worked and works, you know, like how you could do like call MD4, then like call LG3 or whatever, you know, to right. kind of like do that sort of thing. Except um, instead of just like exposing those that ability for like these big layout blocks we let you do it for anything even like the stupidest shit ever like you can change the mouse cursor at different screen sizes you know right um, so every single class can be kind of conditionally applied based on the screen size just by like prefixing the screen um size in front of it's the just class. such a it's such a better experience than bad block like what, bad. element modifier and like SAS was cool, but SAS gets gnarly. And like, I think what's so interesting is that at the end of the day, what you really want is you just want to stop writing CSS, right? Like you want to- Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you just want to like style a fucking thing on the screen. Right, you know right. I mean? and you want, you want and to invent a wanna, name for I, it. I want to do it in the most direct way possible. Like, I don't right. know if you guys ever did any like desktop programming with like win forms or anything back in the day or like even like visual basic or whatever oh yeah oh it's a just like, podcast just like click a button and there's like a properties panel and it's like i set the background color for the button you know i don't like click a button Boop. come up with an identifier for it open another file create some like indirect link between them which is what like you're doing with regular css oh, you know? dude i hate 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 
um, when CSS is another file now. I like can't, I can't handle <laughs> oh, it. I have like a heart God. attack. I fucking hate it. <laughs> fucking hate it. Like the idea that we ever switch between files is so annoying. Ugh. It's terrible. You, you know what? You know what I'm curious about though. Um, uh, you know, if if you're gonna have Tailwind shit as a class name, yeah. On things uh, when you're like debugging your 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 DOM, right? Like, yeah. How do you know where that thing is? All right. Like if it has like a bunch of like, mm, like like you're in Dev Tools and you like find the element and then you want to like go back and find like where yeah, like, oh, yeah, your like, file. like if, I, if it's like oh product tile fucking image, you know, then I'm like, all right, well. Yeah, yeah. I think like for, for me, usually I'm I'm honestly like just doing like a command F for like some distinct combination of what's there. <laughs> that's what you, you know? do. Cause that's what I do. I didn't know if there was a better that's way. What I do. Yeah. Like it's like it command F like uh, font bold PX six MT two. That, yeah. that combination probably only appears like in a couple places, you know, the, 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 the uh, key for tailwind is like, what is it in, uh, um, in VS code, it's like Apple shift L and Apple shift D to like do like duplicate your current selection. I oh, always yeah. find myself yeah, doing yeah. that. Just like, oh yeah, this is the snippet of of CSS that I need to like mutate basically in the next yeah, yeah the group yeah, edit yeah. stuff. Yeah, like you might have like a list and like there's six items in it and they all have like the same classes repeated a bunch of times. Um, and you just like use multiple cursors to edit them. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, multi cursor editing is fire. I think sometimes what I do, Ken, I just like sometimes if I really need to go back to something, I'll give it a fake like unused empty class name. Or you could mm -hmm. just use fucking React profiler if you're. Yeah, you're that's kind of what I was gonna game. say too. Like you can find the React component just using the React Dev Tools or whatever. <laughs> but I mean that only works if that's what you're doing. Honestly. If you're doing React. Yeah. So mm -hmm. are you are you you're not like a fucking CSS guy, right? Like. By 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 trade, right? You're like a PHP. No, like guy I mean, I kind of right? yeah, PHP kind of Laravel backendy dude is kind of where. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, it's uh, like. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of just like like to make stuff, right? So I have to kind of do it all, and um, Tailwind kind of just came into existence because I was live streaming myself doing a bunch of work on a side project like a Laravel and View app, and I had already built this like. CSS framework for myself to use really without even really thinking of it as a framework. It was just like some styles I was copying and pasting from project to project. And uh, everyone on the streams was always like, what's that? What's the CSS framework are you using? What is that? What is that? How are you doing that so fast? You know? And that's when I realized, Oh, I guess man, maybe I should like open source this or do something with it. Cause like people seem to be interested in it. Um, so like, yeah, the, the whole thing only really even exists because I built it for myself in like a much cruder, shittier form than what it is now, obviously. Right. And um, people noticed it when I was trying to like create content around test-driven development and view and background jobs and <laughs> all other sorts of like backend sort of stuff. And um, yeah, then I kind of worked on that for a bit once I saw people were kind of excited about it with a friend of mine, Jonathan, who was working on... Uh, doing a redesign of his app and he wanted to try and use the same stuff. So we used that as sort of like um, a forcing function for kind of extracting it in a way that was like, could be used in multiple projects, you know, and figuring out like what the right abstractions were. Cause we were trying to make it work for two projects at the same time. And then we just released that like in October of 2017 and um, just kind of picked up a lot of steam. And then starting in like, January 2019, I've just been working on that and related things like full time. Yeah. So you you, you bootstrapped a company, right? Like with uh Steve is it Schroger? Schroger. Schroger. Yeah. Steve Schroger. Schroger. Yeah. Unbelievable designer. And uh so tell us about how how that came to be and how you guys sort of collabed on that and then what you what the future holds. Yeah, like me and Steve met because uh one of his good friends was in college with me and uh just in my software engineering program and uh when we were kind of done college my buddy from college messaged me he was like you should meet my buddy steve like he's like a good designer and is always like looking for people to hack on side projects with and this was like back in 13 or something so uh, me and steve met for coffee and kind of hit it off and just started just like hacking on a side project idea together and um you know we've just like been friends and kind of working together on random shit ever since then so 
we kind of got the idea to do like we did refactoring UI first, which is a book and video course sort of thing, the uh, design for developers sort of content. Right. And um, we did that first. I think we started kind of working on it in a sense in like 2015, like Steve had like no audience or anything like that. And we started working on these like design tips for developers, which kind of took the Twitter by storm eventually. Like that's, Steve has like 95,000 Twitter followers or something just from sharing all these like little before and after like UI redesign tips. And he had like 700 Twitter followers when we started. Um, so we did a bunch of that stuff together, like putting one of those tips out like every couple of weeks to build kind of the audience. And then he started doing a bunch of YouTube stuff, which really took off. And we did some like articles and stuff that were popular. And then we kind of announced that we were working on that book and released the book at the end of 2018. And that did like way better than we thought it would. And that was sort of what had paid the bills from then until we did like the commercial tailwind stuff, which was not until the beginning of this year. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the whole story. Dude, it's unreal. I'm a, I'm a huge fan. I'm, I'm, I pay for Tailwind UI. I think it's pretty useful. Like it just saves, I, I think it's like hiring Steve effectively. I've never met Steve. Yeah, yeah. It's like hiring Steve. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and it's cool to see it kind of proliferate um, throughout the startup ecosystem. You know, you yeah. see it like, and you can kind of tell. Like crazy. Yeah, yeah. So, how are, yeah. so if you can, tell us like how, what the reception was like of Tailwind UI. And then like, I don't know what the future holds for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, like Tailwind UI did better than we expected two um i've shared like some numbers and stuff in the past but it starts to attract like a lot of people trying to rip sure, us sure, off sure. lately uh, but let's just say like it does well enough now that we have like a team of six people like wow. on this stuff full time um, that's awesome dude and like we all get paid really well like really senior people um so yeah it's doing awesome and it's actually like growing you know like most of the other stuff that i've done in the past has been like educational content where it kind of does really well at the beginning, but then it kind of just like slowly trails off as like the technology that you've kind of made your content about is like out of date or whatever. Right. Because it's stuff like that. Just that's how it tends to go. But with this stuff, it, we had like a kind of really exciting big launch and then it kind of dipped off. But then like as tailwind has got more popular, like it's slowly actually going up, you know, that's awesome. Years, so that's like the sign of like you hit it. That's, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. And we have lots of ideas for like other ways to improve it and expand it and, and do like other sort of related products um too that we're hoping to hit on in the in the new year so yeah it's pretty exciting for sure so you just launched tailwind 2 which has yeah. a beautiful new website yeah um you. tell us about like what went into that and yeah yeah so tailwind 2 the kind of motivating factor was actually tailwind ui so tailwind ui is like the thing we've been kind of like sort of talking about indirectly for (laughs) a couple minutes now which is like our we think of it as like a directory of examples built with tailwind like um so you want to see an example of like how to do like a feature section for your landing page we have like a bunch of like pre-designed ready to go ones you can just grab throw it into your site tweak it tweak the content tweak the layout tweak the colors whatever you want to do just kind of like way faster than starting from like complete scratch is kind of how we think about it um so we built when we were building that uh the goal was to try and do it all with just like vanilla tailwind like out of the box using like the default spacing scale the default color palette all that stuff Uh, but we just kept running into situations where it was like ah we need to like extend the defaults in this way or these colors don't actually work as well as we thought so it was a kind of an interesting lesson in just like dog fooding the defaults by like trying to build out all these different uh, templates and um we ended up having to ship this like plugin that go along, goes along with Tailwind that like replaced the default design system with like the Tailwind UI one um, that had like a bunch more spacing values, like uh, extended font size scale, a different color palette, like some different shadows and stuff like that. And um, that seemed okay, but our, our goal long-term was still for Tailwind UI to be like, built on Tailwind defaults. So if you just pulled down Tailwind from a CDN, God forbid, because it's like three megabytes, 
Um, it, you should it, be. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a chonky. It's chonky. <laughs> It is. It is. It's an absolute unit of a, yeah. of a, of a CSS file. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you should be able to go here, click like the little clipboard icon and just like paste it in and it should look the same way that it did on the right. Tailwind UI site. But that we found that was like impossible because the Tailwind defaults just like weren't good enough. And we couldn't do, we couldn't change those defaults without it being a breaking change. So the motivation for Tailwind 2 was like, okay, how can we like make all the necessary improvements we need to make and kind of apply the learnings that we have from building Tailwind UI to make it so that like we can do a Tailwind UI update where now it really does just only rely on the defaults. Because I, I feel like that's a better story. When you click like the components link on the sidebar of the Tailwind website, you don't, it's kind of weird when you see a bunch of stuff that's like, oh, this is built with Tailwind, but doesn't really just work. You have to like do a bunch of other stuff first. Yeah, it should be it very, just, very simple. Feels like a weird point of friction. So that was kind of like the main motivation and just to have an opportunity to make like a couple little breaking changes that we thought were worth making. Although I, I tried pretty hard to not break stuff for no reason, you know, like there's certain class names that I don't love that I would name differently now, but like the new names wouldn't be better enough to be worth like making everyone have to update hundreds of templates. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like we have like the border you radius classes like? are called like round. What's your least MD. favorite class name? Probably the border radius ones, like rounded MD, rounded LG. I wish it was just like radius four, radius six, radius eight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but like, if we change that, is that really materially better? You know, it's not. Once you learn <clears> the name, you don't even care what it is anymore. You're Why just not like, both? Yeah, because the CSS file is already three megabytes. <laughs> so, I, so, so I upgraded Fair. Tailwind to like yeah. before this podcast and I was giving Adam some, some, some shit for it. But I will say, having tried and probably failed to upgrade prior CSS frameworks. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you all have been through a bootstrap upgrade, but it's rat. It's, yeah. it's fucking horrible. Most CSS frameworks are not upgradeable. Like, right. They're not. They're just like not flat out not upgradable. To be. It's, it's just like you end up bootstrap, bootstrap four is like a new framework. Bootstrap three is a new framework. Right. Whatever. Yeah. And that's, that's fine. I think like, I, I think that's like a valid way to, do this sort of stuff. I was I really wanted to Tailwind to be like upgradable though. Just like you can move from React 71 to React 72 or whatever one. You know, dude, I wish <laughs> we were on React 71. Oh my god, Ken, could yeah. you imagine? I, I bet there'd be concurrent mode. <laughs> no, no, nah, probably not. Yeah. First of all, probably not. Second of all, like probably no. But yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I so might be able to use class honestly, instead of class name. Yeah, Maybe. honestly, the the Tailwind upgrade from one to two is more or less some search and replaces yeah yeah i don't think it's too bad there's like some config file stuff you need to update and stuff but mostly just like some class name a couple class name changes and if you were using like the old custom forms plugin that was probably a little bit more painful um but going forward things should be like pretty smooth so so yeah that was like tailwind 2 there wasn't really a lot to it honestly in the sense that there wasn't a ton of exciting new features. Like we added dark mode, but like we could have added that in a minor release, but we saved it just so that we had like something exciting to talk about. <laughs> so, marketing at all. What we ended up doing instead is like making the Tailwind 2 launch more about just like the excitement of it existing. <laughs> like that's like the strategy that we took. So we, we built this like insane new website for it, right? We're like the whole Yo, it's nuts. It's, is, like, Ken, have you seen this thing? I have. Can, it's... can you tell the opera singer story? Yeah, yeah. So, so we were make, making a sick website with all these crazy interactive examples and stuff that uses like Framer Motion, and it's it's really cool. Like what Brad was able to do, who works with us. Um, but one day I was on Twitter and I saw, have you ever seen like the Design Plus Code guys? Uh, it's like Meng Two. I'm. I hope. Yeah, that dude's on like a yacht, right? Isn't he like? Isn't have, he sold like a bazillion copies of that? And like, I, is, that, I don't is know. that that Swift UI shit? Uh, I think he might have some Swift stuff. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's but the most, anyways, it's like super the, pretty. The production Amazing. quality of all that, the stuff yeah, that they do is like super high, right? We gotta so, get them on the podcast. Yeah. One day I saw that they did this like uh, video trailer for like their new website on on Twitter, and I was like, dude, this is insane. And I replied to him. And I was like, dude, I need a video like this for my website. And he replied, and he was like, um, yeah, Daniel's the guy who does it for us. He'll probably do it for you. Um, I was like, okay. And then Daniel was like, yeah, I'll do it for you. I was like, okay, this is really going to happen. So we're really going to make like a, a trailer for this new website. And I started to think like, how can we make this the most fucking like ridiculous thing ever? You know, I, I wanted like, how can we make it just like so over the top that 
people you just can't help but like laugh the whole time because well, like our really intro weird. like our intro is pretty exactly. much that. no exactly. no our it's intro just, is it's just, just like when fucking skyrim came out it was unbelievable yeah 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 <laughs> so um i messaged a buddy of mine like actually my buddy colin who's the best man at my wedding who um he plays in a band and does tons of like orchestral stuff for his band and has like scored he even scored a film at one point Whoa. so he's just like yeah. super into doing like all this like crazy orchestra stuff with all these like east west like symphonic plugins and shit and um i asked him I was like yo can you just make us like some trailer music and he's like uh yep that sounds like the funnest thing i've ever heard in my life <laughs> and uh <laughs> so amazing. me and him just like went back and forth trying to find like some good like reference material and stuff and like the best ones we could find honestly were like the avengers trailers you know so the idea was to make it like that so he like scored the whole thing and we like figured out all the timing and then when, when it was done i was like I was like, I had this idea. I was like, man, what if we could do like some like epic choir chants, but what the fuck would they say? So I started looking around on Google, like translate. And I started putting like tailwind, like words into Google translate and translating them to Latin to see what like would come out. I tried a bunch and none of them were good. And then I put in like utility first and it comes out in Latin as like primus utilitatum. And I was like, that sounds fucking it's pretty fucking dead, dude. <laughs> epic. <laughs> so I messaged him. I was like, are you able to like program this somehow? And he was like, probably not, but like, don't forget my wife is actually a professional opera singer, like literally professional opera singer has like traveled the world singing in professional f opera concerts. So we can just record that. And I was like, what? Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we he, can just record that. It's just like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got this yeah. opera singer just chilling. Like, just got that yeah. stock. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's like totally like completely custom music with like a real professional opera singer singing like all these harmonies with like 12 different layers um, singing about tail and CSS in Latin. And uh, yeah, it's just like, the most what, what, it, what, are, what are they saying? What are, what are the lyrics? The lyrics Type are just utility fuck, first, but in Latin. And, <laughs> yeah. That's so ridiculous. <laughs> so yeah, that's so like rad. My, my favorite thing that we've ever done, I think. As hey, like you're, a you're somewhat of a musician yourself. Yeah. Like uh, I've been playing guitar since I was like seven. I don't do it as much anymore, but before I became a full-time programmer, I ran like a recording studio, recording local bands and stuff. And actually how I got into programming. I mean, I was into programming the whole time I was a kid and stuff and I went to university, but dropped out and then just was playing in bands and stuff and kind of just forgot about it all. And then when I got into like recording bands, the software I used, which is this app called Reaper, which is made by the dude Reaper. who made Winamp. Um, yeah, it was like, it kind of like lacked some features from other tools that I wish it had. And I found out that you could like really script the shit out of it with Python. And I thought, hmm, maybe I could just like see what I can do here. And I'm figured out how to make this like basically like this like plugin for it for doing like drum editing like editing live drum performances and like snapping things to the grid and like filling in like the gaps after you like chop all the transients and crazy stuff like that and um after i kind of was like getting into all that stuff and adding all these features to this tool it, it just like reminded me like how much i loved programming because i kind of just like not done it at all for like four or five years and um i was having like more fun building plugins for this tool than i was like actually recording bands so that's kind of just what got me back into programming and eventually decided ah eh, fuck it i'll just go back to school again did like two years in college instead of like the degree program i was going to do originally what was the original degree program it's just like a computer science thing at uh university here and what did and you do instead software engineering technology at a college so like, like our colleges i think are like community thing. colleges like what oh, you guys okay. would call community college oh you're you're from canada that's right oh my gosh yeah. he's a so fucking maple like, syrup eater <laughs> wow i'm so sorry sorry wait wait where, where in canada are you from dude from a town called cambridge which is about an hour outside of toronto oh wow you're not that far from us no not really like i've you, driven like, through New Jersey before all the time you know? No, I actually, I don't think I've ever had poutine. Are you fucking kidding me, dude? It's like the fucking finest food on the planet. I know, I'm not, really, favorite like big, meal. I'm not really a big gravy guy. I don't know. Oh, fucking poutine, man. Holy shit. <laughs> what, what's, what's this jam at? Like in Cambridge, uh, what is it? Fucking Ottawa or whatever the fuck? Like, is, is that the the area? Or no, what, what's closer the to Toronto. It's like, like Kitchener-Waterloo is like the region. So Waterloo. You know, okay. you know where, uh, you know, remember Blackberry? That's like our claim to fame. It's like they were 
all like, in one like the, the the phone the phone yeah oh, wow. god we have like this, blackberry yeah 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 so now like blackberry has been replaced with uh shopify is now our new kind of big what tech is employer. what's like the food out there what's like the main food just boring suburban fucking you have like fucking applebee's white maple, people. maple bees exactly yep exactly we have nothing we have no culture where i live yeah at all what's the canadian drink dude what is it like fucking i, I forget can- the beer There's speaking beer. of drinks I mean, uh like molson and like yeah molson, molson. yeah <laughs> drink uh, molson beat a beaver's ass yeah. <laughs> Ken, uh, what are you? What do you drink? Check. Oh yeah, Coke Zero. We talked about that before. We actually went live. Ken, what are you drinking? Coke Zero. Um, I have some mango White Claws, and I don't know what's going on, but this this batch hits different. Not like alcoholically, <laughs> but like the mango tastes a little bit more pronounced, perhaps mm. a bit more citrusy. I don't understand. Um, but it's it's fucking phenomenal, and I'm also drinking this this bottle of Belvedere. Very nice. Uh, which is good. What are you drinking? Um, Casamico's Blanco and uh, Soda Stream. Soda Stream. It's just like you know for the you know tequila soda mix. Which yeah, no, is... no, no. I have a Soda Stream. It's lovely. Do you ever actually mix any of the shit in? No, no, no. no. I, I. You're I'm just a pure salty myself. boy. I'm not gonna poison myself here. Well, while we're here, um, I, I suppose I'll drop an ad. Yeah, we should here. drop an ad. Yeah. You know, so the, we're, we're we're sponsored by Prism. Yeah right which is the shit um basically uh working with databases sucks <laughs> that's a, a a polarizing statement but yeah if um if you're a front-end developer right and um you know you you want to do some back-end work uh, a lot of the time that does suck and what prisma uh gives you is it makes that shit a whole lot better so it's um it's a next generation database toolkit and ORM for Node and TypeScript. So like, it doesn't matter if you're using like REST or if you're using GraphQL or, you know, using the shit with Express or Apollo, whatever the fuck you're doing. Um, right. It, 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 it makes it super easy uh, to put that back end together. And did, did you have anything to add there, Jared? No, nah, it's great. I mean, it's uh, it's very similar to stuff I do in Kotlin, but it's great. Like, I think, you know, if you haven't tried it out, give it a shot. They have this new data explorer thing that's pretty tight. So, yeah. Uh, or I if you just want to support the show. Backend. I do, I do, I do. But like, if you if you are building your backend in JavaScript or TypeScript, Prisma is probably your best bet uh, instead of, like, rolling your own or using some other like ORM or something like that. It seems like it gives like the best of both worlds. Um, Adam, you have been doing, I actually DM you the other day about some of the backend stuff you were doing. The, the, some of the tailwind stuff is in Laravel. You're like a Laravel guy. Yeah. He's a fucking PHP fucker, dude. Dude. I fuck with that. That's fucking dope. Tell us about what's like, tell us about (laughs) that. And like how you sleep at night. That's kind of like where I kind of cut my teeth in terms of application development is uh, Laravel. And that's kind of like my, how I kind of got started kind of with my business and stuff too. Like I released this big course on test driven development with Laravel. It was kind of like my first really big thing. And uh, yeah, I still love that, man. Like that is what I use for our, all my backends. I've never seen anything that's more productive. I hate PHP as a language, but Laravel as a framework. Why do you hate PHP though? Just like it's, it mostly just feels like lots of little annoying verbose things. Like I have to use arrows instead of dots to access like a property on it. Yeah, that is a little annoying. I have to put a fucking dollar sign in front of every single variable. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like everything is just like, I, I have to use semicolons, God forbid. Um, you know, anonymous functions are like, a bear to write out anytime you want to like access a variable that was declared outside that anonymous function you have to like explicitly import it into that anonymous function it's just like not really the nicest language um and there's a lot of weird things that are just inconsistent in terms of like how it behaves uh, whereas like javascript feels like so much simpler in a way like I don't know. JavaScript obviously has a bad reputation, but like compared to PHP, I find the language to be much more 
enjoyable to write. Like it feels like I can do more with less. No, it um, sucks too. Promise. It sucks too, though. <laughs> it, it does, but it's. But I feel like PHP, PHP was like at least developed for the medium. Like it was developed for writing websites. Like that's what. Yeah, it was but for. like the way that PHP frameworks are written. Oh yeah, that's not, fucking I mean, crazy. You know, like everything's like dependency injection and classes and. Remember back in the whatever. day, like loading up Cake PHP and then looking at Docs, and be like, "Fuck." <laughs> yeah it's a lot I mean, it was like cake not... and like ignite or is that, is that yeah. ignite or whatever uh, uh, yeah a uh, code igniter code igniter yeah, code igniter, code, yeah, igniter. Yeah. code igniter that's what i was saying yeah yeah yep yeah but, it's um, uh it's good though like our tailwind ui like the tailwind ui app is built with laravel and literally it's a server rendered laravel app with like laravel templates with alpine js for a couple little things here and there alpine. there's no like react or anything on the front end at all the Alpine no. Alpine got us in trouble last episode because apparently I cut off Evan Yu showing off Alpine. And people got mm. mad that I interrupted people. Yikes. Some view motherfuckers showed up at Jared's house. <laughs> no, actually, <laughs> no, they were like, oh, there's nobody here. there. <laughs> yeah. But Alpine's great. Alpine um, pairs very nicely with Tailwind, I will say. Yeah, it's it's super nice um, with Tailwind. Like Caleb, who makes alpine is from the laravel world too and i've known caleb for a long time so i get him to add features to alpine for me as needed on That's a sleep. regular basis like, <laughs> ken tell us about how if you can like your your tailwind experience and like at, in in the high performance world versus css in js and all yeah. the emotion style components all the rest of that jazz like how does tailwind fit into that or excel in that area yeah so um i do a lot of large apps and have for quite some time right and i and I, you know i mean fucking large apps and 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 many of them right at that um so a lot of the time you'll see something like sas getting used right or you'll see like uh you know maybe like some emotion or something like that that kind of thing and uh for, for, for me right it, it's always been a little bit of a struggle right like you always like you want to you want to reduce the amount of css that you're getting at any given time because you know if you're like popping out a new window or something like that right like this is the web so like it's not like a fucking virtual window like the shit has to load the resources so it's like the time that it takes for that window to become interactive once you've popped it out and loaded shit up depends upon loading all that shit up right so it's like um when you, when you go around and you have like mad different things and it's dynamic at that, right? Like mad different fucking things. And they're all like fucking, Oh, panel header one or, you know, fucking table cell, some other shit, right? Like uh, what you end up having is you end up having like, first of all, if it's in a separate file, fuck that. Right. It's like you have like 2,500 different style declarations for all these different things, right? Even if they are co-located in the folder, it fucking sucks, right? Because like you could have a component that has like, I don't know, fucking hundred elements or some shit like that, right? Like you could have a very complex component, right? So um, what ends up happening is you, you get a shit ton of duplication. And like when you start to hit that scale, you have mad CSS at the end of the day because it's all scoped to, you know, some stupid fucking name you made up for one individual spot. So where it, for me, where, where, where Terra One Hit was, right? Like, I'm not going to have two megs of CSS, right? I am going to have, have three. Well, no, no I'm going to have, I'm going to have the, the minified GZIP. In development. Yeah. I'm going to have the minified GZIP, but then, you know, you purge that shit and it's even less. Yeah. Yeah. It's tiny after you purge it. Yeah. Once you purge that shit. So it's like, if you use these classes, first of all, first of all, right? I go in there and I look at the class, the class name attribute or you know class if you're writing regular html and i know what the shit looks like i look it's at it declarative, like, okay. right? it's, it's yeah. very much like react in that I'm like, oh this is this fucking thing the rounded thing with the you know black background or whatever and, i love yeah i love yeah. how you could just have a complete understanding of what a specific div or whatever the fuck is doing like you know yeah. what and it's it right there doing. you don't have to move you don't have to move your eyes you don't have to sit here and the shit is like oh fucking pro primary product tile or some shit you don't have to go search sidebar that inner wrapper left find it mm -hmm. fucking go and edit that shit and and hope it fucking let and fuck that dude you change the class name You're, the thing is, is, there like, right? is the scariest part though is the editing of it right because it's like i hope this is the only place this class is used and that it wasn't being used somewhere else where this change is gonna like break <laughs> 
how oh my goodness now like you know I mean? the inheritance and shit like the- oh my gosh like global css is ridiculous you can never delete any of it i have this yeah, problem now um yeah. on my dad's wordpress site we have it's 20 years old we have css back from fucking 2010 that like i don't even know where it's used because it's wordpress and it might have been like sprinkled yeah. in the middle of a page mm-hmm. you have no idea yeah it's terrifying man like anytime you start on an existing project written with any other approach and you need to like do something simple like okay well we're adding this little thing and it's got an icon and some text and i gotta put some space between the icon and the text i guess i have to write css to do that which means i have to name these things i have to find where to put that css so i'm gonna make like adam.css and import that into like the main.css file and hope no one touches my stuff you try and carve out some little corner somewhere you make sure that I hope I'm not using a class name that someone else used somewhere or, you know, so, or even just, like, it's just like coding in terror. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like if you're like overriding some shit, like if you have like blueprint, right. And you're like using blueprint and then like, you're like, Oh, you know what I'll do? I'll go ahead and um, I'll, I'll put this class name and then I'll, I'll do like this, this class that happens to be on this element. And then the next thing, you know, some fucking icon over in some header over here is now like 48 pixels. And you're like, Oh fuck. Like, like that happens all the time. Yeah. All the time. And the shit sucks. Yeah. It's terrible. It's like, wow, the web was poorly, des- poorly designed. And this whole CSS thing is super powerful, but also terrible. I mean, you know what it is? It's exactly like, remember when people thought unobtrusive JavaScript was a good idea? What is where, that? I don't even know what that is. Where like, you oh, should boy. always be like writing your JavaScript in a separate file. And you're saying like document.query selector, find the thing and write the behavior for it um, oh, over wow. there. You know, like. CSS is that by default, you know? It was like a Rails thing, right? I think I think it was just kind of like a thing. Like, I don't know. We should find like some article on like unobtrusive JavaScript that was like written. Yeah, I can't remember. I I remember it something deeply, but I don't remember the context. Can I ask a question? And I don't know this I I haven't been working that long, but has anybody besides Gmail actually just like reskinned their CSS and like made it prettier? Like like I've never seen I don't recall somebody being like, Oh yeah. We're just gonna update global CSS and like retheme the whole the whole app. Yeah, there's just like really, I I'm I've never done that on any of my own projects, but like people like to believe that that's possible. If they write their HTML just right, if they right, craft right. like the perfect document, that it'll never have to be changed because the document represents like the app perfectly. And because like, markup could live without styles in this magical yeah, fantasy. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. I've actually just never seen that happen. If, if anything, yeah. if every time I've rewritten something or rebuilt something, it's been a total rewrite with CSS yeah. and markup and JS. Yeah, yep, I agree. Um, I think we need to just like let go of that, like fantasy. I just, what is the value of it anyways? You know what I mean? I don't know. To be fair, I feel that way now about like some of the React stuff that's come out recently. Like I just assume that we're going to rewrite it all the next like 18 months because that's just how development works now. Like the, the, the problem with that and with, you know, not just React, but like the whole CSS thing is just like anytime you, you allege that you, you can't, right? They say, well, you're just not doing it right. Well, that's yeah. just the ultimate, yeah. like, the ultimate cop out, know, dude. Like it's, it's, it's like, bitch. Like, <laughs> if, if the shit was written right, I, I wouldn't be doing it right, right? Like, mm-hmm. You shouldn't be able to do it wrong. So philosophy yeah. question for you, Adam. I know we're, we're short time here, but when, when, you know, there's all this, I don't know, we had a... Uh, Adam Argyle on from the Chrome team, who's like CSS guru, a guru. couple 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 months ago. Guru yeah. and shout out to Adam. Guru, so, he's an amazing dude, and uh, also his brother's cool too. Um, but and he's talking about like all this crazy like flex stuff and all this unreleased like CSS selectors, and they sounded awesome and stuff. But like, yeah. how do you think about adding stuff to Tailwind, and when do you add stuff to Tailwind? And like, what is, like, talk us through that. Yeah, so the, I think there's like, there's a bunch of CSS features that just like aren't useful from a Tamworth perspective. So stuff to do with like being able to do complex selectors with complex not clauses and stuff like that. That's oh, like, like that donut thing that uh, is coming out or something like that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I saw Adam actually tweet something today that had some, some stuff in it. Did you see I, the donut selector? It was like, so you can like, cascade within a like a a, um it was something that nicole sullivan wrote it was like you can Mm. cascade between two selectors but then like stop the cascade or pick it up again i have not seen that but that that kind of sounds kind of neat kind of neat yeah fucking neato 
Yeah. Generally, like the things that excite me are like there's aspect ratio support just landed in Chrome. Right. Um, so, and that's something we could add in Tailwind because it's just like a property, right? But there's features of CSS that like don't really make sense when you're just trying to style elements directly. Like they're just not really useful. So I definitely pay attention to like new stuff coming out. Uh, I We tend not to add it until it's in like Edge, Chrome, Safari, and Firefox. And Safari is, tends to be the one that like holds us back from fucking Apple stuff. But um, we were supporting even I11 previously, sort of, but now we don't support Microsoft it isn't even supporting I11 anymore. Yeah, yeah it, it, it actually gives me a lot of pride to have like, to be running a tool that's popular enough where us deciding not to support IE11 actually like has some influence on like the developer community at large, not supporting IE11 in, in their projects. You know it's what I mean? Flex. Yeah. It's pretty Dude, cool. I, I dropped, <laughs> I dropped IE11 today when I upgraded CL12. So yeah. open source maintainer question for you. Oh, yeah. good questions. Right. So like I, I've, I've written my fair share of repos in my day. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, Repos. some of them are, some of them are a little bit uh, rowdy, right? Like some of them are the kind of shit where um, there's a, there's a barrier, you know, it's like fucking OCaml financial deserializer shit, you know? And it's like, you yeah. know, like you get zero issues, so sick, that dude. kind of thing. But like, yeah. you know, uh, Tailwind, um, like some of the other shit that I've done it, is a very accessible project, right? So you're getting a lot of different skill levels that fucking yeah. pop right in on that. Yeah. Um, are, are your issues fucking crazy? And do you ever want to throw your laptop in a fucking pond? <laughs> they're not too bad honestly like we have we have 21 open issues and 21 open pull requests god damn that's grooming right there holy that's, shit. that's a lot of work that's when we, you know it's a product okay? we are still you trying to it's... figure it out though honestly like how to manage it because i had it down to like six the other day and then toe and two came out and that one thing that helped a lot was github added the discussion stuff so now anything that like i personally just don't consider to be like a real issue um i just you can do Convert, convert to discussion. To discussion. And, I'm just yeah. like, and I, I check discussions, but not, I don't, I don't look at it as a to do list. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Kenito, that, just guess how many formic issues there are. I'm guessing 170. Uh, higher. No. 92. 500, over 500 issues. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dude, Dude, I believe it. I believe it. It's a disaster. Maintaining and like half of them are like crazy. formic doesn't work. Half of them are like formic one doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I wish I had an answer to how to manage that crap. Like I'm still trying to figure out how to even do that. Like on our team for a while, we were trying Capture. to just have like one person's responsibility was to just be like responsible for triaging all the issues. That doesn't work. Now I think we're going to try like each person kind of has like a couple Ooh. projects Ooh. that they're kind of. What did that person reading? do at that job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you caught him doing uh, something fucked up. You're like, I tell you what you're gonna do. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't think it's that bad, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, hopefully, we. I don't know. I talked to John and Nolan, who runs Ghost, about this problem. Like, how do you guys do it on Ghost? And he's like, I just fucking ignore it. It's not like when there's a bug. That's a real bug. Like, it will surface itself as being like worth fixing. Like, there's you know? that's what I did on Formic, and then you got 500 issues. Like yeah. there's there's real time that it takes to like figure out like if this shit is an actual bug. Oh yeah, I just, no, the, I just the mean first... like I wait until it affects me or until like oh, lots okay. of people on Twitter are saying Tailwind two point oh point two. That's 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 the only way to do it. Tailwind sucks. Scale. That's, scale. Fucking that's, scale. that's the only way to do it. Only way to do it is to basically you have like a core ring of friends, confidants, real users that are giving you feedback. Maybe but like yo, and they'll tell you when shit is fucked. Yeah. yeah. Dude, and it's, otherwise, it's, like, it's a lot of noise. It's such a crazy process. Like, I burnt myself right the fuck out on that shit. And, like, yeah. Hard. It, I don't know. Like, we have, like, a book. I have a bookmark that's, like, all the open issues across all our repos. And that <laughs> one's, like, 500 and something, you know? And that's, like, dude, uh, GitHub doesn't even work for me. Like, the look at that shit. Like, a fucking, work. like, a I don't use the notification. Like, oh. I actually just disabled github emails the other day i was getting emails for every issue every comment on every issue all yeah, that stuff i uh i'm, I'm, I'm with you like it's and yeah, what's also hard folder. is that because i like look at it in my email to me that's like acknowledging it and like i read it but yeah. that doesn't actually mean that i responded to it <laughs> no so the person's like is anyone <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. so it's like a and like you can't that, that fix requires it like from your phone level. either you know so yeah, like, yeah, what, yeah. what the know, fuck you, good is it if someone says says like oh there's like a fucking 
issue here and I read it on my phone and like, am I going to, I can't do anything about it, you know? So anything. Why, why, why am Literally I Literally nothing, dude. You know, you all I've done is? by reading it is make it red in my email, which means I'm less likely to fix to it. Ever find it again. To ever find it again or come back to it. <laughs> yeah. Have you guys ever seen the shit where they're like, they're like, hey, listen, I'm going to need this issue fixed. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to use this library any longer. <laughs> 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 i'm gonna oh, have to shit, switch have to, get to the this money competing back. free library yeah it, <laughs> or like really disappointed that it's been 10 days and i haven't got a response here i just love that and then it's like or you could have just fucking done it yourself chief yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah like PR that's welcome, the thing bitch. that i think bothers me <laughs> it's not even like pr is welcome it's like literally i could have just not made this project and you would have had to write this code yourself and like that's kind of what like you're being paid to do by your boss, right? You fucking so, unthankful fuck. <laughs> so, no, that's not how, I mean, that's how I feel, but that's not what I say. No, yeah. but it's when, they, when people are like Matt entitled and shit. Ungrateful like, shithead. Like, I'm like, you how fucking, dare you? Dude, you should have seen some of the early issues on Slick Carousel, the shit that I would say to people. Like back when like it wasn't a problem. Like We got to look some of these up. Oh my god! I'm like, I'm like, yeah. We got to do episode on. I'm like, be like why don't you shut the fuck up? And like people, are like, oh, <laughs> people are like, what the fuck? Oh, <laughs> uh, like this is this is fucking breaking the terms of service of GitHub. <laughs> yeah, I feel like we should do an episode on the best GitHub comments of all time. <laughs> yeah, there's some there's some good stuff. I mean, it's hard to, I don't know, as an open source maintainer, it's very hard to not be like hypersensitive to like any sign of like in- ingratitude in, in any comment like, oh my gosh if someone, someone mentions- uses like the wrong emoji to do with something like, <laughs> yes, i'm about yes. to ban you from this repo you yes I mean? dude if someone <laughs> mentions any other competing framework i immediately delete the, the like, comment uh! and like and will like lock the issue down and like it didn't happen you, you know what something that's been mean? helping for our issues actually is like you know how you have like issue templates that everyone ignores where you can say like please provide a reproduction yeah yeah yeah, yeah. What I literally do now is I have a saved reply for anything that comes in without a reproduction that just says, hey, you need to provide a reproduction to add a label that needs reproduction. And then visually to me, any open issues that have like a needs reproduction label, I'm like, this isn't a problem until you've proved it can be reproduced. And then when I go back through every once in a while, if I see something that's like 10 days old or older and still has like a needs reproduction with no reply, I just close it. And I just say, Boop. you didn't provide a reproduction. So I'm going to consider- I feel like I might default the label to like, or make a bot that's just gonna look for code sandbox link, mm-hmm. and just if it doesn't have a code sandbox link, just close it. Have you, you seen everything you, need, what need. you does for their issues? What do they do? So when you go to the view repo to create a new issue, they actually don't even let you create a new issue. Um, you click the issues thing, and the the link to create a new issue is actually an external link to like a app that they built where it's like a form that has like required fields and stuff oh, like shit. that oh i should just make this with formium dude i should just make formium yeah. like the link thing I should yeah. make and this, is, this just uses the github link? api it opens an issue on github but like they track the id of the entry internally you know what i mean and the response from github to see like okay well this issue was created through our tool so it's valid but any issues that get opened like if someone just like types in the url on github to open an issue without a reproduction if anything that was created outside of this form that's auto closed by like a bot, you know, so that's what's uh, up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The uh, the guy the guy from Lodash does a thing where like it, it's immediately closed and then you vote with like emoji and he only responds to the ones that are upvoted the most. Yeah, that's a good idea too. JDT is brilliant. I mean, that works. Gentlemen, the uh, you know what's also super terrible. I don't know. I, I've I'm, I've been on this mono repo game for a little while now. If there's like some thing, and I mentioned this something in the last two episodes ago, but like there are two tools that I've been finding very useful. One is called Kodiak, and the other is called Change Sets. Kodiak fucks Kodiak, so right hard though. Sets. Kodiak is great. So Kodiak, if you you basically set up like code owners and you set and you like protect your main branch, uh-huh. and basically if you approve the brand, if you approve the uh, PR or the PR when the required checks pass it will merge and then it will go back and update all the other um whatever it can update without a merge conflict it will go up and update every other pr hmm. that's cool which is useful not super useful if you've got 95 open prs like i do on formic but pretty useful if you have 20 yeah well how do you spell it 
I can't uh, find it. Just C-O-D-I-A-K. Okay. I still can't fucking find it. But uh Oh I'm sure you can send it to me in the show notes. Yeah. The um yeah, it's it's uh it's Kodiak HQ, I think. Uh the yeah so oh, I anyways, the, uh, yep, I so uh yeah. anyway we uh, we're ending on an hour here so we might as well uh blow this process again we should uh end uh with some picks can oh, canito school stand oh uh, uh, a pick for me oh um hmm wow um i got two picks today um one is uh if if you're in the if you're in the business of christmas some business. folks aren't, but you know, if you are in the business of Christmas, I just picked up um for the first time ever, I got a Fraser fir as my tree, and it's fucking lovely. My God, what an unbelievable tree! If 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 you're gonna go get your Christmas tree on, um, yeah, it seems infinitely lightable. I've gotten other real trees before, and uh, if you're gonna go real tree, that's a good way to go. Um, if you're not gonna go real tree, you're smart. And you're going to get a fake tree. And what you're going to do is you're going to put the lights on, and you're gonna put the lights on it. And you fucking put the fucking thing in the attic with the lights still on it. So when it's Christmas, you bring it the fuck down and it's fucking pre-lit and you don't have to waste your time. Yeah, we but, have a pre-lit Christmas tree. God it's just like damn built it. in and you just, you just plug it in and it's just great. <sighs> Jared, do you think this is silly that we put fucking trees in our house? No. Go out and buy a fucking tree from the forest and put no. it in the fucking living room? Do you think Sick that like, shit. first of all, so aside... So my, my mom was like VP of design at Estee Lauder. She would decorate the Lauder's Christmas tree. And that shit was like, like my mom, like Jewish American princess, would decorate <laughs> the fucking Lauder, like Estee Lauder's fucking Christmas tree. Was it all like fucking silver and gold? Dude, it was and like shit? ridiculous. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> she showed me pictures of this thing. It's like, the shit is out of a Christmas carol. Like it's, it's fucking amazing. Disney, Coca-Cola brand. Like it's all the ridiculous all the things you would imagine a christmas tree and more Bones um and, and so that being said though no there are no christmas trees in the palmer household uh, but there are very festive uh hanukkah do you, have, do you have more than one menorah lights no 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 there's lights and there's wreaths and there's white shit and it's like it's not a yeah. christmas tree but there's this like festive wintry pagan shit that yeah, i will say right? like like at the end of the day it's fucking you know a pagan solstice holiday, right? Like fucking end of the end of the harvest. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's before cool. the winter, before everyone dies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Christianity is just Jewish fan fiction anyway, right? <laughs> there you go. So the uh, you know, you know how it is. <laughs> so my second pick is Jordan Elevens. Um Elevens. Elevens, yeah. Um, I, I fucking walked around barefoot for like the last like nine months, basically. Um, and you know, do you guys have like, shoes in Canada, Adam? And they have shoes uh, yeah, made guys, those yeah. are those those are those things that are like they're made of wood. They have like this bunch of straps on them. You use those to walk on top of the snow. Right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Snow yeah, shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Around your fucking feet. Saint Bernard runs up with a fucking martini in its neck thing. <laughs> I think yeah. those are policemen <laughs> in in Canada. It feels really good to put sneakers back on. So those put those sneakers back on. Things. Did you? When was the last pair of Yeezys you bought? My last pair of Yeezys. I think I sent you some uh, stuff. The, the, By the way, Goat is like my favorite zebras? app. Goat is good. My, my, I think my last Yeezys were either the the gray zebra ones or the white zebra ones. Were yeah, the reflective zebra shits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, I'll give you my anti pick this week. My not pick. Yeah. Restream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Fuck my restream. not pick. Oh, man. Fucking us in the just destroying us there. Yeah, whatever we're all good though we did set an all-time record for most concurrent people watching our ridiculous podcast yeah that's pretty cool nice that was pretty tight so adam you you hit the you hit the you hit the spot jared do you have anything positive to say here today um what do you like this week i got a new a tailwind yeah tailwind too i'm pretty (laughs) pumped about that um and i'm pretty pumped about uh i just oh i set up github sponsors nice Look at myself you. and right now it's like funny it's like normal normal rates except there's one like 69 dollar a month one where you get access to my only fans 69 <laughs> nice. 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 um no, no no actually actually serious um shout outs is to i don't know i'll call it um 
Oh, yo, AWS did some fucking crazy shit this week. Uh, I don't know if you've been following like reInvent where they just build new versions of the same shit they already have. But um, AWS is like containers runtime for Lambda. That's pretty tight where you just like, instead of doing a serverless function in a specific language, you can just use a Docker container. Uh, they also added Docker containerization for AWS LightSail, which is like their DigitalOcean thing competitor. And then they added this thing called Proton, which is literally exactly ECS, like Elastic Container Service, but with like a different UI. Interesting. But like they built the same thing with a different UI. Um, and they changed the words from like, instead of it being this arbitrary thing, like cluster and, and task definition, it's environment. Nice. That's it. So yeah, that's my pick. AWS for the week. Nerdy shit. Totally cool. Adam, you got any fucking picks this week, man? Hey, I've been thinking about it just now. So I Maple probably syrup. could come up with better ones, but here's like a, here's a couple. So um, my first one is Microsoft Excel, which I think Sick. is uh, the most best of the best underrated application ever made. Uh, nothing shit makes me happier hard. than cooking some formulas in Excel or some pivot tables. Uh, the other thing I was going to say pivot is, tables. I love pivot tables. Woo. Um, yeah. Very go few on, things go have on. in the history of mankind. Few inventions have actually surpassed pivot. Like relativity is one, <laughs> but like yeah. after that, it's pretty much relative. Einstein's it's the like, general theory of relativity and then pivot tables. Yeah. My <laughs> Top two. Yeah, <laughs> Top so two. the other, th the other angle I was going to go, is like, I've had this idea for a long time to start like an affiliate <laughs> blog. Okay. So I, I own this domain shamelesscomfort.com. Wow. And uh, the idea is to just link up products that really lazy people who just don't give a fuck what anyone else thinks about them Love it. would benefit Me from. A fucking link. Dude, I'm there. How <laughs> do I invest in giving you money? So here's like a couple. Shameless comfort. Oh, shameless it's so good. Com. So I'm trying to think of like some of my good shameless comfort items. I got, I got two good ones. So one is just like a long shoehorn. Everyone should just own a long Oh, it's shoehorn. fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. No one, you shouldn't be one. putting your fucking thumb between like your. My brother uses shoes. one, dude. It's so funny because he used to work. He works at Goldman, or he worked. Yeah. He had to go into the office wear like a fucking suit and tie every day, mm -hmm. and his lazy ass would use like a a you big don't ass shoehorn like, to like put on his like Johnson and Murphy or like yeah, like laceless like, shoes, right? You gotta go yeah, with yeah. laceless shoes and a long shoehorn, dude. I don't have to bend at the hip for anything. Ever. Dude, also yeah. Velcro shoes. That's some shameless also, comfort right there. Yeah. I got these. I got these shoes the other day. I think they're like Nike, like React Phantom slip-ons. Those something. are hard. Those yeah, are hard in the great. paint. They're great. I love them. So those with the long shoehorn, and I'm good to go. I'm out the door. Never have to. I bend can't over believe you guys nothing. use shoehorns. Get some fucking Ferragamo sleds and stop being a pussy. So okay. So <laughs> and the uh, the other one. Now this one is more. Actually, I got two more. I got two more. So the one is, at the product is called Lazy Readers. So lazy readers are like glasses that have angled 45 degree mirrors in them that you can put on so you can lie in bed flat on your back, but like still hold up a book and read it. Um, I love it. Or watch TV on the wall, like lying flat on your back. That's awesome. Sick. Awesome product. Another one is, um, so sleeping on airplanes, right? Like this is like a problem. That when are we ever flying so, again? Yeah, I mean, like, like, literally again. when? But now is a good time to do. buy this product because it's probably cheap, right? So All here, right. okay. So everyone gets those like stupid neck pillows that like go around your neck that are like U shaped, which is like the exact mm -hmm. opposite of what you want when you're trying to sleep on a plane. Cause all yeah. that does is like push your head forward with nothing to put it on. Right. Um, this real secret to like being able to sleep on a plane is not like having something comfortable around your neck. It's not having to hold up your head. You know, is like that that's fucking, the thing that it's, keeps it's you like, You see the thing that's like you lean thing? forward. Yeah. So what I got is like an inflatable thing that goes on like the meal tray you blow it up and it's like a massage chair. Ken, what would like you hold do for your face? You just put your face on it and just like pass the fuck out with this giant inflatable <laughs> thing under you while everyone on the plane looks at you like you're a complete asshole. But you don't care because it's shameless comfort. Yeah. <laughs> the shameless comfort. I, I, I popped that chip while you were sleeping. Back. Way to tie it back. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be all drunk and shit. I'd pop it with the side of sunglasses. Oh my gosh. <laughs> There's another one that I saw that was even better. That's like a strap system that you tie. Oh my <laughs> God. Head. It's just cool. You put like your in your and you're just like oh. that's amazing <laughs> oh my goodness yeah. that's incredible i gotta, I gotta kind of such a good oh my goodness how do i just like give you money for shameless comfort like i'm so there 
Like yeah, that's what the I'm world needs right that's now. That's like that's my retirement kind of venture, you know, like when I'll build it with some crazy weird technology that's totally overkill and it's fun, you know, and uh just buy dumb you know, shit and review it. Yeah, that'll be good. <laughs> and then the New York Times will buy it from me. Well, so we'll have a wire cutter. Yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah. Um wire cutter's pretty good, by the way. Actually, I love the really wire cutter. Is, I, I like was like fucking super anti at first. I'm like, fuck this hipster bullshit. And then fucking it is actually. And then you read like best fleshlights of 2020 and you're like, oh, wow, that's actually pretty interesting. I'm like, I knew it was the Avatar one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. I got to run. Yeah, but, we got to uh, get out of here. Um, anyways, how, Adam, how can people follow you and follow what you're working on? Yeah, so I'm Adam Wathen on Twitter. Uh, you can follow Tailwind CSS on Twitter or tailwindcss.com. That's kind of everything. Um, check it out. Sick. Well, uh, for the Undefined Podcast, uh, I'm Jared Palmer. And I'm Ken Wheeler. Fuck you guys. Peace. The fuck out. <laughs>